Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Rise of Home-Based Care, How Jefferson Health is Engaging More Patients at Scale. My name is Morgan Hafner with Becker's Healthcare. On behalf of Becker's, thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. And if at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We are here to help. With that, I'm pleased to welcome today's discussion panel. First is Dr. Kate Bean, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Population Health Officer at Jefferson Health, a 14 hospital system with locations in Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey and more than 3.8 million patient interactions annually. Dr. Bean leads Jefferson's strategy and implementation of value-based care. Prior to this role, she served as the CMO of ARIA Health Physician Practices and VP of Clinical Effectiveness at Jefferson Health Northeast. Prior to joining Jefferson in 2015, she was Enterprise Senior Medical Director for Cigna Health Spring, a Medicare Advantage health plan. Her responsibilities included clinical oversight over the Cigna Health Spring clinics in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Tennessee, and Texas markets. She was also the clinical leader of one of the first innovative care models in Philadelphia, the Bravo Health Advanced Care Centers, modeled after the nationally recognized Care More model. Dr. Bean currently serves on the Regional Policy Board of the American Hospital Association and on the board of the Delaware Valley Accountable Care Organization. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Christian, Kristen Vogel, who is the Enterprise Vice President of the Musculoskeletal and Post-Acute Service Line at Jefferson Health where she leads the enterprise integrated and strategic financial planning process for the service line. She has a physical therapist background and 20 years experience in academic health systems. Kristen was recently awarded a $37 million grant as operation co-lead with Dr. Bean as the clinical co-lead for the Department of Human Services Regional Response Health Collaboration Program and the Regional Congregate Care Assistance Team. These programs were designed to support COVID-19 readiness and response in long-term residential care facilities, improve infection prevention, and facilitate continuity of care and other services to mitigate the risk of spread of COVID-19. And last, certainly not least, we have Asish Shah, who is the CEO and co-founder of Bina, an AI-powered care at home platform and network. He founded the company in 2015 and remains passionate about empowering care teams with the tools they need to help people age in place. A recognized thought leader, Ashish previously served as CTO at MetaCity, the market leader for vendor neutral health information exchange solutions that was acquired by Aetna for $500 million in 2011. Under his leadership, MetaCity built a healthcare network with over 1,300 hospitals and 250,000 acute and ambulatory staff sharing over 2 billion health records annually. But none of this connectivity impacted what was happening in the home. The light bulb moment came following his own experience with an aging parent. Ashish found that professional caregivers regularly observed changing health conditions, but lacked the digital infrastructure to share insights that could help people stay well cared for in their homes. Today, Dina works with many leading health systems and managed care organizations, including Jefferson Health, to extend their reach into the home to help people live their very best lives. Dr. Bean, Kristen, and Ashish, thank you for being here today. I'll now turn the floor over to you, Ashish. Thank you, Morgan, for that kind introduction, and welcome to all of our attendees, and appreciate all of their patience as we work through uh, virtual logistics here with the webinar, something that I think many of us have gotten used to here with with the current pandemic that we're living through. Um, as, as we uh, begin today's discussion, I want to remind everyone uh, of, the, of the objectives for today's conversation. You know, today we want to really explore many of the trends that are driving care into the home and in particular understand Jefferson Health's experience with exploring that model. We want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the CMS waiver programs with a specific spotlight on hospital at home. Um, and then 
take a look at Jefferson's experience specifically around managing through the COVID-19 pandemic and how has that really influenced how they transition and potentially shift care outside of facilities and into the home and community when it's appropriate and makes sense. And I think the way that we want to ultimately close the conversation is to share lessons learned and really think about how to evaluate these types of models, think about how we define and ultimately measure success uh, for programs like this. So thanks again for the opportunity to be here and and, uh, welcome to my co-panelists as well. Um, why don't we jump right in and start to look at some of the trends that are that are driving care into the home. Um, clearly, there's been a, a lot that's happened with the existing pandemic that, you know, just overall hospital-based capacity has been challenging. And so we've needed the opportunity to surge and treat people outside of, you know, the four walls of a physical hospital facility, for example. So we're also seeing a lot happen with federal regulations. So if you look at things that CMS or Medicare has really started to promote moving forward, including items that are included in the currently proposed American Jobs Plan, um, there, there's quite a bit that's been allocated to help reach people where they are in their homes and in their communities and also address really critical things like social determinants of health. We're also seeing hospitals, health plans, and retailers form really creative partnerships with home-based organizations to really help them extend their reach outside of their traditional service area. Um, Groups like Intermountain and other uh, well-recognized health systems have, have already started to make uh, some significant progress in, in those types of partnerships, as well as plans like Humana, who have uh, teamed up with groups like Kindred at Home. Um, with that, you know, I, I want to bring in one of our first panelists here, and Dr. Kate uh, Vian. And Kate, you know, we, we've talked about this a lot in terms of some of these trends, but we'd love to understand um, how Jefferson Health is thinking about this trend, these trends around home-based care and, and how the system is evaluating it, uh, the opportunity overall. Yeah, no, sure, thank you. Um, and uh, really happy to be here. Um, so I think, you know, before we talk about it, a little bit about that, you know, value-based care is certainly a driving force in this, but just wanted to back up a little bit and acknowledge that, you know, because of advances in, in medical therapeutics as well as technology, um, you know, we can even have this conversation, right? Um, I think that, you know, about 20 years ago when I was in residency, there are many things that patients had to be in the hospital for um, that today they don't need to be in the hospital for because of advanced therapeutics. And so that's really kind of a a key enabler in in, in order for us to even think about hospital care in the home. The other, of course, is technology, which is really critical. Technology is, as we know, um, still um, evolving. Um, and we've got some great technology out there, but it still needs to evolve more. Um, and so we'll be talking a little bit more about that. But I just wanted to call out those two things because, again, I think it's, it's, it's really important to consider, um, you know, the advances in medicine as well as technology that has enabled, you know, these conversations or even considering value, uh, hospital in the home. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of value-based care, you know, since the ACA in 2009, um, uh, you know, we have been driving towards, and really healthcare systems sometimes have been pushed towards, you know, lowering costs and higher quality of care. Um, you know, CMS is committed to moving certain percentages of our care um, to value-based care. Um, our payers in many markets are also doing the same. Um, and so, you know, it's become more and more important um, for health systems and provider groups to really develop um, competencies, care delivery models that actually can deliver on lower cost, higher quality of care. Um, at Jefferson, we are certainly seeing that too. Uh, our two largest um, value-based care arrangements with payers, which probably have over 100,000 uh, patients in them, um, are both um, you know, downside risk. So we have some financial responsibility for those, um, and, and certainly we can do things, you know, which are kind of bread and butter for, for most health systems, you know, trying to reduce readmissions, trying to decrease unavoidable uh, or avoidable admissions. Um, but, you know, I think to really bend the curve in terms of uh, quality and cost, you really have to start to change your care delivery system in, in a much more um, significant way. And so that's really where um, healthcare in the home and hospital in the home comes in, um, where um, we've, we've seen some models out there that actually have demonstrated you could do that. Uh, you can actually cut costs and improve quality. 
Um, you know, the other systems to um, many systems are owners of health plans and also other systems are, are very much engaged with um, uh, full downside risk with um, payers. And so um, they have much more of an incentive to um, really um, refine their models in, in hospital and home. And you'll see in the, in the literature, those who have done it success, successfully have actually um, um, have been sort of um, fully engaged with payers and capitated models. Um, so, you know, and these are, these are all relevant to Jefferson right now. Um, we are sort of on the verge of many of these things. And so, you know, we've been talking about hospital in the home, and Chris will get into this, you know, before the pandemic, but certainly like everybody else, um, the pandemic and COVID-19 has accelerated many things. Dr. Beam, fantastic perspective. And it, so it sounds like, you know, this is something pre-pandemic that Jefferson has been thinking quite a bit about. You know, as we zoom out for a moment, it seems like many organizations in the industry really has been on this pragmatic journey into home-based care. Um, you know, there's been quite a bit of effort around establishing a post-acute or a home care delivery network, um, which has a lot of different capabilities. Um, some, like Jefferson, uh, invested very early in virtual care services, and the market is clearly coming along for that. Um, but we're now sort of seems to be moving towards a, a next phase where there's a creative bundling of existing resources and investments into new service offerings. You know, this is where Kristen, I'd, I'd love to bring you into the conversation. And as the enterprise VP of, of the post acute service lines at Jefferson, we'd love to sort of get your perspective on how does Jefferson think about that first aspect of it, designing that post acute network and also thinking about, you know, what services do you include today? Um, I would, would love to just dive a little bit deeper into that. Absolutely. Thank you, Rishi. So when you think about your traditional post-acute care network um, that many of us have, Jefferson was really focused on looking at the entire continuum, focusing on home care, hospice, inpatient rehab, our skilled nursing facility, and then our outpatient therapy clinics. So we really wanted to focus from the moment that patient leaves to wherever they would go post-discharge. We've put a lot of effort into our long-term care and skilled nursing facility partnerships in placing medical directors in those facilities, having frequent touch points, regional meetings, um, to review any of the new regulations with healthcare and then the outcomes for all of those facilities. Our ultimate goal is when we're look, working with these partnerships is looking at all of those things that Dr. Ian talked about and looking at value-based care and decreasing the cost of care, decreasing readmissions, decreasing length of stay, increasing the network integrity with our health system, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it's increasing patient satisfaction because the patient truly needs to re remain at the center of all of the care. So now we're really looking at changing our focus and anticipating what is healthcare truly going to look like in the future and how is that going to have an impact on our post-acute strategy for the future. And as you think about COVID, I'd love, um, Kristen, to get your take on how, what are some of the newer capabilities that perhaps weren't a part of the, your first generation post-acute, let's call it 1.0 network. What do you think about in terms of 2.0, uh, in terms of new potential services that you may need to partner and include? Absolutely, yeah. So when, when I, think about that question, it makes me really go back to what has Dr. Steve Clasco, our president and CEO of Jefferson Health and Jefferson University said for many years, is that he wants to build health care without an address. Patients are more comfortable in their own homes, so we need to really focus on broadening our homebound services, our home care services, um, really working on building our primary care visits in the home and our APP house calls. We have a lot of these already in the system. So it's how can we work to further integrate them into the system and provide care in the patient's home, which is where they want it. We have to think about the courier services. How do we get things to patients more expeditiously than we you know, have typically done in the past? And then how do we continue to anticipate what those needs are um, ahead of the game? and not waiting more reactively, but being more proactive about it. 
This is a this is great. I, you know, one of the things that naturally comes to mind, I think, when we explore all of these different phases on this journey to home based care, is naturally payment. Um, and this comes up in a lot of conversations. I, you know, in in all of my work throughout the industry, there never really seems to be a lot of pushback on a lot of these innovations or models. But payment is one of the things that uh, I, I know that at times can be one of the the key items that needs to be worked through. I, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into each one of the various uh, mechanisms for being paid or ultimately reimbursed for for services like this. You know, if we step into home-based services as an example, um, today traditional fee-for-service Medicare will cover things like eligible home health services that cover skilled nursing facility or skilled nursing services, um, PT, OT, speech pathology, medical social services, and maybe even home health aid services. Um, and then under Part B of, of Medicare, uh, when approved, durable medical equipment that can be delivered into the home, things like oxygen and other types of therapy. Uh, now, we're starting to see new capabilities come online. Medicare Advantage plans and managed Medicaid plans in particular have started to approve supplemental benefits or long-term support services that can be delivered into the home that really are designed to help people stay out of long-term nursing home care, really drive down, as, as Dr. Behan mentioned, that total cost of ownership, and really address things like social determinants and improve patient and member satisfaction overall. So there's a lot of emerging mechanisms. Now, uh, there's also private pay services. And, you know, I, in particular, I was uh, intrigued by the, the recent announcement from Advocate Aurora to partner with Senior Helpers, which was a large private pay home care capability. So we're starting to see a lot of creative relationships and partnerships around extending both paid and private pay services um, into the home and community. When we think about virtual care, uh, telehealth is one of those things that clearly was expanded significantly over the last 12 months. You know, today we have over 135 services um, that can be covered via telehealth. In particular, uh, examples include ED visits, inpatient nursing facility visits, um, and then as well as discharge day management services can all be delivered and then reimbursed via telehealth. Um, remote patient monitoring has also seen a significant expansion. There's quite a few uh, CPT codes now that can be um, billed against and submitted so that providers can actually invest and deliver a, a more connected uh, remote patient monitoring experience. Where there's there's a lot of work to be done and, and still some area for uh, some work here is if we look at the bundled services. Um, we'll dive a little bit deeper here on the hospital at home waiver program, but um, Places where there's not really clear line of sight are things like SNP at home models. Now we're seeing commercial insurers really start to work with providers on delivering a service like that. We also know that the MedPAC or Medicare Payment Advisory uh, Commission is also looking at site mutual payments there as a mechanism to potentially push a model like that forward. Uh, but there's quite a bit of work um, and available opportunity to bill against things like chronic condition management programs, uh, as well as new emerging value-based care uh, care models here. Um, so th there's a lot of opportunity to potentially invest and then ultimately be paid for um, tapping into each of these different uh, models here on home-based care. Um, but Dr. Behan, you know, I, I'd love to kind of jump a little bit into the virtual care in particular. Jefferson and Dr. Clasco in particular was very early and, and uh, bullish on, on telehealth, for example. I'd love to get your perspective on um, how, did, how did that process play out? I mean, what, what was going through the health system's mind in terms of making a decision like that, especially, you know, when it wasn't protect, particularly obvious, um, you know, like in the last 12 months with the, with the current pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. And I do like how you described uh, Dr. Clasco being bullish because that I think is a appropriate description. So, you know, his vision very early on, even when he first um, became CEO of Jefferson, you know, 2013, 14, was that telehealth was going to be critical uh, in terms of future as a way to, you know, improve access to care, um, to actually meet the patient where they are as well. And so uh, really invested very much in telehealth and brought some, you know, great talent to Jefferson, Dr. John Hollander, who's really led our program around that, um, and 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 slowly started to um, um, really, you know, uh, 
launched the program within Jefferson, you know, just like anything that's new, um, there was a little hesitancy from physicians and other providers, you know, in terms of, is this something, do I really want to connect with my patient through telehealth? Um, it's too complicated to get everybody to, you know, um, the technical part of it, it's too glitchy. And, and so, you know, lots of different excuses. But again, because of, you know, the team that was very dedicated to this um, and the high priority that was placed on this, um, they continued. And, and so, you know, each physician and, and, and provider was tasked with having a certain amount of telehealth visits you know, uh, during a month period. And so that enabled, again, Solid Solid built the competency. And then when, you know, in 2020, uh, beginning of 2020, um, we were very much prepared for um, COVID. And, you know, Dr. Hollander and team quickly, quickly um, further stood up telehealth so that we had uh, most providers on it that, and we converted many, many inpatient visits to telehealth. So, um, it was just a, you know, an example of uh, an investment and a vision, really, that 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 paid off for um, the patients, really, um, and uh, and still giving them access to care during this, you know, the pandemic, which was obviously a very scary time for people. Yeah, but I really appreciate you sharing that perspective, and, and kudos to you and the entire leadership team for the, the early work that you did. But it seems like there's some valuable lessons there that can be applied as new innovations like remote patient monitoring and other types of technologies that will emerge that can be applied. So um, thank you again for sharing uh, sharing that perspective. Yeah, I, I did want to jump a little bit deeper at this point into the hospital at home waiver program. You know, it's one of the, the areas that we, we, we touched on here in terms of uh, payment. And just to kind of level set with everyone, this is a newer program um, that was really activated to increase the health, you know, the overall healthcare system's capacity to be able to treat people during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is a, a program that's been approved by Medicare to deliver hospital level services for older adults um, in their homes. And it creates an opportunity for hospitals, health systems, or other providers to receive inpatient payment that's equal to the same of if a patient was ultimately being seen and treated in a hospital. And just as a backdrop, this is, you know, there are up to 60 conditions um, including asthma, pneumonia, CHF, COPD that could be safely treated and effectively treated at home. And you know, I, I do want to take a moment to recognize the many innovators in the space. This is, I, I know there's a lot of conversation right now in the industry around this, but there have been many, many who have been uh, early in this journey on hospital at home delivery, starting way back in 1995 with Johns Hopkins. And then there have been many behind that that have built upon that experience. We have now uh, over 100. Uh, 20 plus hospitals that are enrolled in that waiver program. So, um, quite a bit that's that's uh, happening in the space. You know, Kristen, I wanted to pull you into the discussion here. I know that you've been uh, involved from Jefferson's perspective on evaluating the hospital at home initiative. Um, is Jefferson a a current enrollee in the waiver program? And and if you, based on your answer, I'm curious on you know what led to that that decision. Sure. So Jefferson did not enroll in the program. Um, as of last week, there was only two health systems in the state of Pennsylvania and one hospital in New Jersey that are enrolled in the program. When it first came out, there were there was a lot of initial confusion with state, federal, and local regulations. Uh, the guidance just wasn't clear. There was differing opinions from many of the different regulatory agencies. We we started to go down the route and then realized that we were kind of hitting some barriers. And at the end of the day, our vision was always to meet the community wherever they were located, even if it was in their home. And when we really started to think about it, we're already providing a lot of the aspects of the hospital at home care prior to this waiver coming out. For example, we are already doing home infusions. We have our APP visits that go to the home. We have home health. We have our home health and the um, remote patient monitoring. The other thing that was really hard is that when you really dig deep into the waiver, the, the patient's home has to meet the hospital conditions of participation, according to CMS. So when you think about all the hospital policies and procedures, it just causes a lot of other confusion. 
when we first started talking about hospital at home prior to the waiver and really prior to the pandemic starting, our starting point was thinking about the observation level patient and then also the inpatient um, for an early discharge. And we weren't really setting our sights on that acute inpatient um, setting, thinking, well, those are the patients that truly need that hospital setting. What is that level of patient that we can prevent from using a hospital bed and or prevent from using a hospital bed longer than it's actually needed? So looking at the, the opposite end for the observation level and the early discharge. And with that, we decided, let's try to build that capacity in preparation for a payment becoming available. We know that there isn't truly a payment outside of this waiver from any of the payers to make this successful. So our thoughts were, let's get all the logistics in place. Let's make sure that we're ready. Provide a proof of concept to the payers to then say, we've kind of figured all of this out. We did all of the problem solving up front, and this is the model that we would like to provide to, to then be able to negotiate a payment. Going through this, we realized that, you know, it's one size doesn't fit all. There's many different pieces that need to go into it, and there's different solutions for different aspects of the care. So we have, at this point, we have not enrolled in the program, but we're still moving along in planning for what would this look like and what is that model that we could take to the payers to develop a reimbursement um, payment model. It's fascinating. So it sounds like you, you're actively thinking through the design phase, and you know, from what you shared, the logistics of delivering on it. So we, we talked a little bit about payment, but what does it actually take to deliver the service is something that Jefferson is being very thoughtful about. You know, just, just for the, the attendees right now on, on the webinar, just to kind of provide a, a quick high-level overview of, of what it takes to deliver on a model like this, you mentioned the conditions of participation. Um, for a provider to be able to deliver on a hospital at home service, you need to be able to deliver extended nursing care uh, into the home potentially uh, available on a 24 by seven, uh, 24 hour by seven days a week basis for urgent uh, and emergent I issues that are arising. There needs to be the ability to have daily physician evaluation um, one multiple times in the home. Think about physician rounding workflow. Um, be able to capture and review uh, two sets of daily vitals um, that align with the actual health system policy around monitoring and capturing of that data. So. It's, it's not a separate uh, monitoring policy. It's, it's got to be aligned with the hospital or health system policy there. And the ability to, to use care pathways to treat those 60-plus conditions that can be safely treated in the home. Um, also, the ability to have infrastructure. So I think when you talked about uh, courier services and other sort of capabilities that you can bring into the home, that includes lab testing, other diagnostics, mobile imaging. Um, there's, there's quite a bit that needs to be thought through. Uh, in terms of how do you bring that just in time in a very responsive way when it's being delivered in the home. And then, you know, one thing that I found interesting is it, it doesn't all have to happen in the home. There are moments where there's an MRI or another key procedure that actually requires the patient to be transported and taken into a facility. That is something that is allowed and included as part of the, the waiver program as well. So th there's quite a bit involved in actually delivering this logistically to match the experience that happens in a hospital. Um, a lot of opportunity for really neat innovation here. Um, you know, Dr. Behan, I wanted to ask a, a question here for you. Um, how, how are you thinking about, from a Jefferson's perspective, your existing capabilities? When, when you look at these types of requirements, um, how, do, how does a group like Jefferson help think about getting started? Yeah, no, it's a great question because, I, you know, you could – you know, when you think about it, you could be completely overwhelmed because you think you've got to build the entire care delivery system. And that's what this is. This is really building a new care delivery system, a different level of care. So I think it's a matter of sort of just, you know, methodically going through, you know, the resources that you have within your system. And then, you know, using, you know, there's a lot of great literature out there. CMS has provided it. You know, you talked about the, the other health systems that have done this accessibility. And so sort of learning from them. Um, but, you know, there are other things that I think are important considerations, right? So, you know, you have to have the ability to, to, to determine the right population, right? 
you need the right eligibility criteria. You know, what diagnosis can you potentially do? It doesn't have to be, you know, four of them. You could just focus on one. And that's what we're thinking about doing. We're thinking about doing focusing on two diagnoses. Um, where, where are the locations of the patients, right? So I think that, you know, geographically, in order to make this a model that is, you know, not staff heavy, so you can sort of do it with a smaller number of staff, you know, having the, the patient population within a certain location that is uh, proximal to the hospital, right, which enables sort of short, shorter distance driving between the patients and also the ability of the patient to get to the hospital if, if the patient decompensates. You know, the insurance plan, um, the other things are, you know, the ability to assess the home environment is really important, right? Um, and one of the things that is uh, one of the CMS requirements is an assessment of social determinants of health, which I think is fantastic. Um, you know, it's sort of a, one of the things that in healthcare we don't do enough in terms of assessing it, um, but this is, is critically important, especially in the home, uh, to, to determine, you know, sort of what, you know, what are the issues that, and barriers that could be present. Um, it's also, I think, really critical to develop a home quality program. Right, so we've got these fantastic, you know, hospitals have been working on these fantastic quality programs in the hospital, but then how do you do that in the home and how do you ensure really a culture of safety, zero harm in the home? Uh, you need the ability to document, you need the ability to track certain metrics, you have to report on key metrics. So all of those things um, need to be developed and, and you know, what we, we are doing is leveraging the expertise that we have for our hospital-based uh, quality folks to be able to do that. Um, and, I, you know, most hospitals, I think every hospital has that type of team, and that would sort of be the ability to leverage that expertise. Um, I think you need to make sure you've got the – you can find the staffing that are suited to home-based care. Um, you know, you can't assume that hospitals will want to do this. You can't assume that primary care docs will want to do it. I personally think it's sort of a hybrid of the two. Um, you know, you, you need folks that are independently um, practicing or comfortable doing that or comfortable practicing in the home where you don't have access to a CT scanner you can get in 30 minutes or tests you can get right away. So you have to have sort of the right kind of staffing model in place. Um, and then, um, you know, and they're pr comfortable providing that care in the home where, where, again, you don't have all of the resources you would in the hospital setting. Um, you also need to have um, an ability to, uh, for a way for patients to have um, on-demand audio remote access, right? So that if there's any issues, they, they need to be able to connect to a team immediately. Um, and then there has to be an ability uh, protocol set up so that if the patient is decompensating quickly, um, they need to quickly be assessed. Um, and if they are assessed in the home and need to go to a high level of care, they need to get there. Um, the other important thing is develop partnerships with your own uh, service lines, with your cardiologist, with your pharma pharmacy team, with infectious disease, and include all of them in the planning process because, again, that is critical. Um, and then finally, last but not least, and certainly this is not an all-inclusive list, what's the discharge plan, right? So discharging a patient from hospital or home is really important because you know, you, you need the care plan. You're going to sort of pull out some of the services, but you want that patient to continue to recover. So, um, you know, having that care plan and what does that look like, what staff, you know, what staff does that look like um, is, is also important. Dr. Behan, it's a, it's a fantastic perspective. It sounds like there's clearly a lot to do with capacity, coordination, logistics. You know, we, we know how complicated that is in a traditional healthcare setting. You know, we, We've advanced now to the design considerations, and you've touched on many of these things. If we if think about the traditional setting inside the facility, you know, there's every floor has a nursing station that's half 24 by 7. There are physicians around. Um, pharmacy is something that medications can be delivered just in time into the into the patient's room, um, and even something as simple as a call nurse button. When you're in a hospital bed, uh, bed you can hit a single button that connects you to that nurse station. And there's a really responsive service. You know, when we think about the advancements, you touched on this, the advancements in diagnostics, and even the ability to sort of deliver and organize some of these services in the home and community. Um, are there other, other aspects that you think about that are really critical to delivering on, on a high-quality in-home care experience? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think technology is the, is the key part of that. I think it's still evolving. I think that, you know, 
you know, who, who, who we take care of as a home is somewhat limited by technology, you know, to sort of uh, just go from, you know, having the analog version of, of hospital uh, uh, in the home the same as what it would be in the facilities would be way too expensive. And so I think technology is going to be critical. It's still evolving um, and, um, you know, lots of good things going on out there, but it's still evolving. Um, and so, I, you know, again, the, the, you know, setting up a network of reliable ancillary services is, is, is very important um, as well. And, of course, you know, your, your nursing team, um, which is really kind of extremely critical uh, in terms of the, this care model um, and making sure that they have the training they need, the comfort they need, and, and the resources they need as well. You know, just to, just to get a little bit more specific, I know a year ago um, you and I were on the phone um, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the, the COVID-19 outbreak, and there was a lot of uncertainty here. And I think all organizations, Jefferson, Dina, uh, others, were all sort of pushed right into the fire of trying to figure out how to deliver these sort of capabilities in the home community. Do you mind sharing some of the, the experiences that we shared um, a year ago and what was the mindset, what was happening in Philadelphia um, you know, just one year ago? Yeah, no, sure. And I, I, and I think probably for those on the, um, in the audience, I'm sure a lot of this resonates as well. So, uh, you know, I think all systems and, and, you know, even primary care practices and other, you know, independent practices, we're really trying to figure out, you know, how, how do we do this, right? How do we take care of uh, COVID patients? How do we actually keep our staff safe, or ourselves safe? And so, uh, you know, my team in particular, which is focused on, you know, population health management um, and high-risk patients and care coordination, was really suited to um, try and, and support um, the organization um, on the outpatient side. So, you know, you and I, you called me one day and, and uh, you know, said, how can I help? And so um, it was sort of a perfect timing because I think that, you know, where we, what we were trying to figure out is how do we actually take care of all these patients in the home that actually don't necessarily need acute care, but they need monitoring. And so, um, you know, your team and my team worked really closely together and developed a, you know, a, a, a SMS SMS texting platform, which was a daily check-in for patients, for COVID patients, positive COVID patients um, in the home. And um, we, um, you know, we were able to launch that pretty quickly. And I will tell you, it was, it was really a success. It was both from the patient standpoint, but also from my staff, because they felt like they could reach more patients. Um, and they felt like they were contributing, right? And they were reassuring patients. The patients also felt that, you know, when we, everybody was in lockdown and they felt like they didn't have access to health care because they heard all these things about surging hospitals and overwhelmed EDs, this was sort of kind of a, a lifeline in some ways. I mean, I maybe a little bit dramatic in that, but I think it really was a touch point where they actually could reach out and talk to a nurse. Um, so it was, um, you know, it, it really was a... Um, uh, you know, a, a critical part of, of what we did and how we managed many patients in the home. Um, it, it was such a, a uh, incredible moment. I think for us, you know, we, we're in this space. We spend a lot of time um, cultivating technology solutions as well. So we didn't have time to waste. You know, everything that we did needed to be instant on. I think, um, you know, what we're probably most proud of is that we helped support over 3,600 COVID positive patients at home with an engagement rate north of 75% while expanding the capacity of your, your core care management team. So I know that we could certainly build on it. The, the other aspect of the, the solution that I just wanted to touch on here really quickly were um, it, there was a lot of creativity here, and I think this is a lot of what we're going to see with care at home models. It was really the intersection or combination of remote patient monitoring, patient engagement solution, care management, telehealth, all really being brought together in something that was an instant on experience. And so I think as you know, vaccination rates grow around the country um, and we really start to think about how do models like this become semi or permanent, semi permanent or permanent, um, it, it's not necessarily gonna be the, the off the shelf solution that they exist today, but I think it's really the combination of these solutions um, that ultimately need to be, again, very accessible for the patients, 
but they need to save a lot of time for the, the care managers and the nurses and other clinical staff that have a already an overwhelming amount on their plate. So we're going to have mm-hmm. to manage what's happening in the facility as well as what's happening outside the, the Port Walton Hospital. Um, I think I agree with you, Dr. Van, that technology is a, a very big role. Um, yeah. in the, I want to um, bring Kristen back into the conversation here. Uh, there's a lot here that, that we've talked about in terms of this journey into home-based care, um, how to get paid for it, some of the logistical challenges around being able to deliver next to the problem, and, and how do we build on what many of us have done in the middle of COVID. Um, but as we start to think about um, many, many of the folks in the audience, do you mind sharing uh, some of your high-level thoughts on how you're thinking about evaluating Jefferson's writing this for models like this and any sort of lessons learned in this area? Sure. So the first thing I want to say, and I feel like this is my theme overall, is that it's not one size fits all. Every hospital and system needs to make the best decision for themselves. There are many companies that are looking for health systems and hospitals to partner with. At the end of the day, you want to maximize your expertise and your resources to make this work. One of the most important parts, and I can't stress this enough, is ensuring that you have executive champions. Um, you, you need to have leaders that help to develop the vision and then are able to execute on the decisions that are made you know, during those vision ses- sessions. Capacity constraints are real. Um, we, we know that there are benefits in starting with our own existing resources. At this point in time, we don't have the luxury of being able to, you know, pull in all new people and, and partner with everything. Um, we believe that in the beginning, we can leverage our existing hospitalists, geriatricians, and PCPs for our, our high-risk patients to get this started. And then as we move forward with towards sustainability, and of course comes funding with that, um, we can start to build dedicated capacity for the model. It's also important that you need to have a backfill strategy. You need to have clear opportunities to share risk with the health plans. And when you're sharing risks, you're not only, you're gonna lose part of that revenue, but you're also, you need to be prepared for that lower reimbursement. So you want to have a backfill strategy and you're, that you'd be focusing on those high margin and high acuity patients to put into those beds that you maybe would have um, taken through the hospital at home program. And as Dr. Bean really um, clarified is that the patient selection is, is really the key. It's not appropriate for every patient and you as a hospital and a health system need to decide what level of care are you providing in that patient's home, whether it's observation level, inpatient acute care level, or more of that early discharge, trying to get that patient out sooner and you're just finishing up the days, a couple days at home. Lastly, you really have to focus on building the competencies and physician confidence. Every patient is different. Every situation is different. Um, every physician is different. You're, you're going to come across physicians that are used to having everything at their disposal in the four walls of the hospital. So now you have to think about it differently, and you have the patient at home, and what are the things that we can bring to the patient's home to make that physician feel confident in the success of a program? Through the CMS waiver, they provided a list of key considerations, and I don't want to go through all of them, but you know, I would suggest really looking at them and determining, are you experiencing problems with capacity? Do you have an established home health care delivery capability? And can your system align with the payment providers and ultimately the hospital for this? So, I really appreciate you sharing your perspective on how Jefferson thinks about whether the model is right for them. And if I could summarize, you know, once you make that decision of whether there's good cultural fit and alignment within the organization, then it's, it's about starting small and scaling smart and, and really thinking about once you make that decision, making sure that there's a clear financial model, thinking about your capacity and maybe redeploying the existing resources, um, as well as leaning into additional partnerships. You may own your own home health organization, or you may be partnering to fill capacity into the region, leveraging your existing care management uh, team, 
And then, as, as Dr. Bian mentioned, incorporating technology to really organize those logistics to match the in-facility experience. And then, and then also thinking uh, very clearly about the success criteria so that you know what, what goal or uh, what the scoreboard looks like as you're operating the service. Um, Kristen, thank you for all of your, uh, your thoughts and uh, perspectives here on, on how Jefferson thinks through this. Dr. Beanie, I wanted to give you an opportunity to have the, the last word here and, and maybe summarize how you think about success um, for initiatives like this. So we've talked about how to evaluate it. We've talked about how to get started. But um, what, what does success look like? Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, I, I think that long-term success, um, certainly, you know, financial sustainability, of course, is, is critical. Um, and, you know, the barriers to that right now is is having reimbursable, reimbursable uh, payment models, which, you know, I think is, is the big challenge. You know, hopefully CMS has kind of opened that door and will consider making that more permanent. Um, you know, physician staff and buy-in, right, that this is a level of care that is sustainable, that if I'm a physician in a practice, I want to refer to hospital in the home instead of sort of the traditional hospital. You know, having a clear staffing plan, right, um, is, is really important. The operating model for this um, is critical, right, because this is uh, lots of logistics to think about, you know, sort of aligning that operating model, which is uh, in terms of what is already going on in the hospital operating model, so you don't have two different operating models, so maybe it's an expansion of that. And then superior patient experience, um, really, really important. Um, I would add just experience, but also outcomes is important. You know, and some of the criteria you could look at is um, improved patient outcomes. So, so again, there have been groups out there that have demonstrated this, lower cost of care, decreased readmissions, ED avoidance. Um, really as important is having a culture of safety, ha having that safety program that um, that prevents any kind of harm. So, so sort of a, we like to say at Jefferson, zero harm, um, and that's really important. Um, you know, again, patient and a family satisfaction. I think that caregiver satisfaction is critical in this as well. Um, if, if you build the model, it will en enable you to take on more risk-based contracting uh, and more risk, and I think that that's important as well. And then, you know, lastly, which is probably a further bit down the road is, you know, doing this ultimately could decrease your incremental capital investments. But again, I think that's further down the road when this is more of a scaled out model. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to take this moment to say uh, thank you to, to both you, Dr. Behan, as well as Kristen, for taking the time to share your perspective and insights on on this rapid transition to home-based care and how Jefferson is thinking about that, both in terms of pre-pandemic perspective, living through it in the last 12 months, and then sharing how how you're as an organization and as leaders thinking about how to really position yourself to deliver a great service like this in your in your communities. Um, I think we've uh, we've been able to cover a lot of ground in a very short period of time. I, I do want to invite all of our uh, attendees to follow uh, follow us online and continue the conversation. I know that there's been a number of questions that have been coming in, and we'll do our best to follow up on all of them. But you can find both um, many members of the DINA team as well as Jefferson on LinkedIn, Twitter. You can hit our website. There's a number of ways to be able to engage in the discussion. We'd love to keep that conversation going. Um, but with that, Morgan, I wanted to uh, turn it back over to you. And, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, our work together here with Jefferson Health. Absolutely, Ashish. Thank you so much for your presentation today and also Dr. Bean and Kristen as well. I think we have time for a couple audience questions today and then we will um, wrap up our presentation. So I'll go ahead um, and ask a question that has come through. You know, what has been the financial impact on Jefferson since implementing the home care services, such as overall per capita cost, improved quality scores, readmissions, et cetera. Is there any insight um, that Dr. Bean or Christian could provide into that? So I, th I think that we are still a little bit early in that in terms of having any kind of clear uh, numbers. Um, we, we do, I will say that we recognize that, you know, this will be an investment before we may see returns on this. Um, and Kristen, I don't know if you have anything else to add. 
No, I don't have anything else to add. I think when you're when you look at the success of the program and you're thinking about those quality metrics, um, you know, it, it's just really important to keep the patient at the center and ensuring that you're you're seeing success with those patients and that things aren't moving in the wrong direction. Um, so you're able to keep a, a good pulse on how things are going and waiting to scale until you have kind of those moments of success and then begin to scale from there. Got it. Thank you so much. And another question that has come in, which DENA tools have been the most helpful to Jefferson's successful implementation in the home health services space? So uh, I would say, you know, the combination of both the uh, texting tool and the ability to, you know, integrate that with remote patient monitoring. So we, we use um, the integration of pulse oximetry with uh, the texting tool so that we could, um, you know, manage a patient being sent from the ED to the home. Um, and these patients would have otherwise been in observation level care, but because of that, we were able to keep patients in the home safely. Um, and, you know, having, uh, have those uh, um, vital signs transmitted to us directly. So I think that that has been uh, quite helpful, uh, actually really helpful, I should say, uh, in terms of, of managing those patients. That's really helpful for understanding. Thank you for your insight there. Another great question has come in from the audience. What remain your biggest challenges with your hospital at home program? So I'll take that one. I think right now it's in the state that we're in, it's working through all of the logistics. Um, again, because I said, you know, not every patient is the same, not every solution is the same. So it's working through and being able to identify all of those barriers that you may hit along the way to be able to provide a proof of concept because we can't have that proof. We can't go to a payer or we don't picture going to a payer without having that proof of concept to say this, laying it all out and saying this is what's going to happen when we have a patient with CHF or COPD. These are all the things that we would provide. So we need to think through all of those different aspects of care that need to be taken into consideration and any of the barriers that they that we may hit and come up with possible solutions. So it's really working through all of those logistics, getting them as perfected as we possibly can, and then being able to identify a payer strategy and a reimbursement strategy that we're comfortable with. That makes sense and a really good question. So thank you for um, submitting that. We have a question that's come up about um, clinicians and have either of you seen any resistance from clinicians when you are implementing this program? Um, so I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's resistance. I think that, um, I think there's, I will say there's a little bit of, um, you know, um, you know, in terms of who who is in the home, there's a little bit of different thinking about who should be delivering the care in the home. Should it be the hospitalist or those who are already doing home-based care? Um, which, you know, I think there's differences of opinions. Um, but in terms of resistance, I think that, you know, with our referring docs um, who would refer into the program, it really is actually just demonstrating to them and really going, you know, sort of, you know, laying out the plan, these are the services, and this is what we're doing. We've got, you know, the, here's the model to give them a comfort level. And I think that, you know, with that, um, you know, we, we don't really have any resistance. I mean, I think that, you know, recognizes the importance of, you know, if you can deliver care in the home with as good standard of care, higher quality, lower cost, and, um, and in the patient's home where it's much more comfortable, sometimes for seniors, um, that is much better to do that. Absolutely. Thanks so much for answering that question. We have a question that has come in about brand. Someone's wondering, how do you extend your brand into the home? Do patients implicitly understand they're still part of the Jefferson Health solution system, even when they're in their own home? 
So I think that's a, a great question, and I've been thinking about that since I saw the person post it. You know, as, as Kate has talked about, we, you know, we haven't started this program fully, but we are already providing care in the home. So this is an extension of what Jefferson is able to provide. When we think about having our home infusion, our home health, we are touching so many patients and remembering that in order for the patient, you know, where we think we're going to capture the patient, it's going to be once they've already entered the, the doors of the hospital. So they're already part of the Jefferson system. They're in either observation care or we're looking at an early discharge. So it provides us with that opportunity to right then and there before the patient leaves our, our hospital walls that we have an opportunity to do the education to ensure that they realize that they are in the hands of Jefferson and that Jefferson is just continuing their care in the comfort of their own home. So we have a great opportunity to leverage the Jefferson brand and then also to continue that once the patient is home, the goal isn't to just, okay, let's do this hospital at home program and then Jefferson's done. Majority of those patients will then continue on to your traditional home health um, and we can continue that relationship with them. Thank you so much for diving into that question and a really great one from the audience. So, you know, appreciate your engagement there. We do have time for one more question today. It comes from someone who is wondering, how did you evaluate and build a successful technology and innovation partnership? So, so that's it's a great question. I think that, you know, when it comes to this, I'm not sure that there's one technology solution that fits all. Um, and so um, uh, we've got a number of, of um, uh, companies that we're partnering with um, that sort of have different, uh, you know, are, are sort of um, solutions for different problems. And so I think that, you know, you have to kind of first, you know, what's the problem that you're trying to solve and that, you know, you may have one, one particular partner that can do that, but then another that can. I know it's kind of a vague answer, but I think that, um, you know, you have to really explore, you know, what, what do you need, right? Are you looking for a use case for hospital and home or maybe you looking for chronic disease management? And so what exactly then do you need that technology to do? Um, and so, um, you know, there, there are many, you know, many companies out there that are, are really working with a lot of different health systems. So I think that, you know, it's just a matter of which, which are the right ones for you. And again, I would say that there's not one that, you know, be prepared that there's not one technology that solves all the solutions. I think the one thing that I'll add there is, you know, just for those who are out there that are in the, in the business of, of creating products and offering it, I think it's, we all have a responsibility to be very open-minded as well. I think if, um, you know, when, when the pandemic really started to um, you know, really dominate a lot of our our mind share, I think there's a responsibility that everyone in the space needs to have to just be part of the solution. And I know that, that was something certainly that, Dina, that we we talked quite a bit about and then openly with our, with our partnership here with Jefferson Health. Um, we had to do things that weren't necessarily – uh, right off the shelf for us or things that we had in our technology vision that were way out into the future and move some of those things up. And so I, I think this is a very dynamic space. You know, I think today we've heard, you know, the needs around organizing perhaps a new set of capabilities outside of the hospital beyond the traditional post acute network. I think we've talked about, you know, how to really create connectivity into the home and use technology to organize those logistics, but also connect with patients and their families. Sometimes that's going to be with devices. Sometimes it's really trying to simulate that, that call nurse button to try to be really responsive. Um, I think there's an incredible amount of innovation and opportunity here. And I, I know that, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of our organization with Dina. We really appreciate the open-mindedness that Jefferson Health has had um, as we co-innovated together around a lot of these problems. There's, there's many new things that are emerging uh, with care at home that just nobody really anticipated. So. You know, picking a partner that's really responsive, I think, is going to be key to, to early success here. Thank you so much, Ashish. And thank you, a final thank you to Kristen and Dr. Bian, too, and our um, audience today. 
been a really delightful conversation. Um, and a final thank you to Dina for sponsoring today's webinar. So if you would like to learn more about the content presented today, please check out the resources section on your webinar council and fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.